Chris and everyone, welcome to the our Department of Visualization, our distinguished speaker series. And I'm sorry for the technical problem. Fortunately, we just resolved. All right, our Chris, please uh, allow me to give a brief introduction uh, of you, and then we'll start your presentation. So Professor Chris Johnson is now a distinguished professor of computer science, and he helped found it, the Institute, the Institute of Scientific Computing, sorry, and Imaging at UDA. Now the Institute is a large body and research center of over 150 faculty, staff, and students. And Professor Johnson has served on a number of international journal ad, 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 editorial boards and also advisory boards to of several national and international research centers. He is a fellow of the long list, AIMBE, AAAS, SIAM, and IEEE. And he was, he was uh, recently inducted into the IEEE Visualization Academy. He also has received a number of awards, including NSF Presidential Faculty Fellowship Award from President Clinton, a DOE Computational Science Award, the Governor's Medal for Science and Technology, and there's a long list. Finally, I just want to mention that our Professor Johnson was recently awarded the 2020 Leonardo Award. So let's start the presentation and relax and enjoy. Now, please. Thanks very much and uh, hello from Salt Lake City. Um, all right, uh, when I give my presentations, I like to uh, start with just a little bit of history uh, because I don't think that m many people, most people know about the amazing computer graphics and visualization history at the University of Utah. Um, back in the, uh, the 1960s, uh, David Evans was brought from UC Berkeley uh, to start the computer science program at uh, the University of Utah. And he was told to go out and get the very best uh, people uh, that he could find. And the first person he hired was Ivan Sutherland, who is known as the, uh, the father of computer graphics. So it was a pretty good hire. Uh, Ivan ended up receiving the Turing Award for his work in graphics, National Academy of Engineering, Science, uh, et cetera. The, uh, the third faculty member uh, was number nine, Tom Stockham, uh, who was a signal and image processing guy, also a National Academy. And uh, those three faculty then started educating students and some amazing students <laughs> that they had uh, that came through. So our alumni, John Warnock, who founded Adobe, uh, uh, created the hidden line of removal algorithm for his uh, PhD dissertation. Um, Ed Catmull, uh, who uh, co-founded Pixar with Avi Ray Smith and Steve Jobs, and has been the, the, the uh, CEO of, of Pixar for a long time. Um, Jim Clark, who founded SGI, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, um, Netscape, Healthion, many, many others, Alan Kay, uh, another Turing Award winner who uh, created object-oriented languages in the, in the very beginning. Number seven is Nolan Bushnell, who got his bachelor's degree at Utah and invented Pong, one of the first uh, video games, and then he founded Atari, sold Atari for a few hundred million dollars, and then founded Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theaters. Um, anyway, the long list of amazing uh, people who have gone through, and I was very fortunate when I was a, a young professor to get to know um, almost all of these people and, uh, and really ask them about, you know, how did, you know, you guys do this in, uh, back in the 60s and 70s in a then even smaller place in Salt Lake City. And they said it was all about finding amazing people uh, who could collaborate effectively. And that's something that I really took to heart when I was um, building the, the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute, the so-called Ski Institute. And here are the smiling faces of the uh, faculty, staff, and students where we have a lot of amazingly smart people who really collaborate from uh, multiple disciplines. Um, and our research cores are in uh, scientific and information, visualization, biological, medical, and geophysical image analysis, and biomedical and scientific computing. 
And just to give you a flavor of the, the interdisciplinary nature of the Institute, these are some of the research centers. So a long running NIH Center for Integrated Biomedical Computing. There's a uh, Valero Pascucci heads a large DOE Center for Extreme Data Management Analysis and Visualization. Uh, Valerio and I and Chuck Hansen direct this uh, Intel Graphics and Visualization Institute. We have a Center for Computational Earth Sciences, also a, uh, com a Center for Computationally Designed Efficient Materials that Martin Berzins and Mike Kirby um, direct. Okay, let's talk about visualization. These are a, a couple of snapshots uh, from Domo. And I really like that uh, every year they put one of these together and they talk about uh, the immense amount of data that's out there and the increasing amounts of data that's out there. So the one on the right is from 2021 uh, and the other one on the left is from about five years ago. And, and I, I put this up here also to just really note how things are changing so quickly. So on the, on the left, you, you, you don't even see things like Zoom and, and Discord and TikTok and other things that have been developed really uh, and taken off in the, last, in the last few years. But if you look at just the numbers on that, this is every minute of the day. So 5.7 million Google searches every minute of the day. Uh, Customers are spending $283,000 on Amazon every minute of the day. And we are contributing to one of the uh, 856 minutes of uh, Zoom webinars uh, every minute of the day. So it's just, just incredible. And uh, so how are we gonna understand all of this data that's streaming everywhere? Uh, and to answer that question, I show you a simplified version of your brain. Uh, so this is a, an image where the brain has been broken up into uh, into the different senses. And as you can see, uh, more than half of our brain is dedicated to vision, um, is to sight. So we are very, very visual creatures. Then comes touch and then comes hearing and smell. And lastly, but important, uh, taste. Um, so if we can come up with ways to turn that data into something that we can understand visually, then that's a good way to, for us as humans to, to understand it. And the, the process of creating those, those abstractions is, is what visualization researchers spend a lot of time doing. Um, and as an example of a new abstraction, which are very difficult to do to come up with, new successful uh, visual abstractions, um, this is a, this is one that uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist came up with, which are now called Feynman diagrams that he created to try and understand uh, this really complicated mathematics of quantum electrodynamics, which he, he used to uh, do the work that he received the Nobel prize for. And you see his van there off the left with Feynman diagrams on there. And there was a stamp issued a while ago with the Feynman diagrams. And uh, when uh, James Leake wrote his biography of, of Feynman, he, I have this really great quote, what I'm really trying to do is bring birth to clarity, which is really a half acidly thought out pictorial semi vision thing. I would see the jiggle, jiggle, jiggle or the wheel of the path. Even now when I talk about the influence functional, I see that coupling and I take this turn like it was, there was a big bag of stuff and try to collect it in a way to push it. It's all visual, it's hard to explain. Well, that's what we do uh, is, is to try and come up with uh, new ways to better understand physical phenomena and data. And at the Ski Institute, uh, we have a number of visualization researchers and they, they spend a lot of time working with application researchers uh, in medicine and science and engineering and now even more in other fields and social sciences and even humanities. So we're, uh, we're finding the need to do visual data analysis pretty much everywhere now. Um, and some of the, the highlights that you see here in the, in the very middle is, is a visualization of, of then the largest simulation of a spiral galaxy forming by Elena Dognia, who was at Harvard at the time when she did this, an astrophysicist. Um, and the data was so large that there, were no, there was no visualization system available at the time, and she found us. And, asked if we might be able to visualize the data. We had recently created a parallel ray tracing system. 
So she fed X to me her, her many terabytes of disks because that was the highest bandwidth and still is often the highest bandwidth when you get into that level of data. And we, uh, we made these visualizations. On the middle right, you see a visualization uh, of, of combustion. And again, a very large scale data set that runs into many, many terabytes of data uh, from Jackie Chen at Sandia National Labs done on some of the biggest supercomputers in the world. And it's a combination of looking at uh, volume rendering of the combustion flames, but also doing a topological data analysis to look at features. And on the middle left over there, what you see is from Mariah Meyer is a uh, collaboration with geneticists who are looking at models for comparing the genetics of humans uh, with other mammalian species in a way to better understand the data. And what I'm gonna do is highlight some of these uh, these collaborations that we've done to show you some of the visualization research that we've done. Um, the first one is flow render. And this is work that was done by Chuck Hansen, my colleague and his team. And uh, it's a really great story because uh, it, it really came from the application research as a biologist who was studying zebrafish um, in which they had designed zebrafish to be transparent so they could look at the organs developing and they were interested in, in the, the development of those organs. So they had video cameras trained on the zebrafish watching their organs develop over time. And then the poor graduate students would have to go through and like hand segment these, these hours and hours of, of zebrafish videos to, uh, to get the different organs. And uh, uh, Chi Ben Chen, the biologist, knew there must be a better way, came to us and uh, linked up with, with uh, Professor Hansen. And what came out of that was this, this uh, system for visualizing confocal microscopy uh, and other types of imaging data to do multi-channel and visualization and interactive segmentation to follow and track cells um, and then to scale it up to large scale visualization. And uh, let me play this little video as, as uh, a collaboration with, uh, with uh, one of the geneticists. Flow render is a tool that was developed for confocal microscopy data. And it's, it's focused on giving biologists an easy to use method for doing visualization and analysis of 3D confocal microscopy data. So Gabriel Cardin here at the University of Utah has found that Flow Render is a valuable tool for her research in the Cardin lab. The Cardin lab works on congenital defects in muscle development, such as congenital diaphragmaticonias. We're using it to image developing limbs and developing diaphragms, which are very complex three-dimensional structures. So I would say that we would be unable to do any of our work unless we have flow render. That's the kind of, of uh, feedback we like to have from our collaborators. This is another really cool project. Um, several years ago, Mark Lavoy at Stanford uh, was able to get permission to use a high resolution laser range finding scanner to digitize the Michelangelo statue in the Academia Museum in Florence. Uh, and uh, he, there were so many millions of triangles that he didn't have a way to, uh, to visualize it interactively. And we, we had developed this parallel ray tracing system called the real-time ray tracing system. And here we're, we're taking that statue and zooming in on the eyes where you can get a sense of the level of discretization. So sub-millimeter level discretization. Um, and we were able to uh, change the lighting. So you, when the statue used to be outside, you could see what it would look like at uh, different times of the day. Uh, one of our videos was next to the uh, Michelangelo statue in the, in the museum for a while. So that was cool. But what was even cooler is uh, more recently, the, the statue was scanned at uh, much, much higher resolution. And what you're seeing here is uh, zooming into that same place where now it's almost a billion triangles. And each of these frames is two gigapixels, not megapixels like your camera, but two gigapixels. And my colleagues, Valeria Pescucci and Chuck Hansen, created the technology to be able to stream interactively these massive size data sets. You can see now that in that same place, the, at this resolution, uh, it's, it's so highly resolved, you can't even see those individual triangles. You can see um, the marks in the, in the 
the, from the sculpture and, and the, uh, the defects in the marble. One of the things that we learned uh, from this is when the statue was outside uh, many years ago, uh, someone, I'm thinking probably a teenage kid, uh, carved their initials into the back of one of Michelangelo's legs. And, uh, and with because we have the whole statue at such high resolution, we could uh, discover that uh, we, we could see that in, in this next pass here, we, we're going to be able to see the, uh, the initials MN in the, in the leg of Michelangelo. No one knows who that is. That's, uh, it's still a mystery. Um, so right here, hopefully you can see MN. <laughs> one of my uh, favorite current projects that we have is a project called Open Space. And it's a collaboration with astronomers and astrophysicists and NASA to be able to visualize um, NASA data. And I'm sure you've all been to the planetariums and seen these amazing uh, star shows that they have. And uh, uh, that data takes you know, a long time to, to put together and, and make them into those impressive shows. Uh, a few years ago, NASA came to us and said, well, you visualization people are, could you actually uh, do something like that with real NASA data from the telescopes, from simulations, from the various missions to Mars, et cetera, and uh, be able to project it on these domes for astronomers and astrophysicists to use for research? And we said, yes. And so they gave us some money and we created the Open Space Project. And it's, it's uh, a collaboration with the American Museum of Natural History. That's where the Hayden Planetarium is. Uh, in the middle there is uh, Anders Jinnerman at uh, Norsherpeen University in, in Sweden. We're in the upper right there in the Warnock Engineering Building. Um, Claudio Silva and gang at uh, NYU and then NASA. And the idea is that we've created this system uh, called Open Space and it is open source so that anybody can get it, grab it, download it, play with it, do whatever you want to with it. Um, and it's been now deployed to a number of planetariums, uh, but it can also work on your desktop, on uh, walls and other, other devices. We're, we're now in the process of, of uh, creating a virtual reality version of this. So let me give you just a taste of what open space looks like. This is uh, uh, Gene Payne, who's one of our open space developers, and he's just uh, we have a, a multi-touch table, that a visualization table that he's just uh, kind of scanning around the, uh, the solar system here to show you how easy it is to manipulate. And all those stars are in the right place. All the, all the, uh, the trajectories you see are in the right place based upon the, the NASA kernels. And uh, so now we'll zoom in. And what you'll see is that as we zoom in, we're gonna pop in in real time these NASA images uh, from the NASA servers. And, uh, and now we'll continue to zoom in. Not surprisingly, we're gonna zoom into the University of, of Utah. Uh, there's a Great Salt Lake you see there. And, and as he moved in closer, we pulled in higher resolution images. And now we're gonna project them on our, our power wall, which is 36, 30 inch monitors, giving us 41 megapixels of information. There's the University of Utah. And, and Gene has just taken his hands off of the table. And you see that the, that the image is rotating. And that's because we pulled this in an image real time and, and the earth is rotating under that satellite that's there, which I think is just really cool. Um, and uh, we recently pulled in the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey of the galaxy data. And so this is all of the galaxies in our universe that the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey has, has surveyed thus far. So there are, it's just a, still blows my mind to think that each one of those dots is an individual galaxy, not a planet, um, but an, an individual galaxy. And now we're, we're putting it up on the, the big power wall just so you can kind of see the complexity. You'll see that there's that, that part that's missing there, and that's because of our own Milky Way galaxy. We can't see through it because it's so dense, so we have to look above and below our, our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so I think it's a really cool project that we're continuing to work on. It's another really great application called the Connectome. And this is an international project of collections of neuroscientists 
who are using different image modalities to try and better understand the structure of our brain. And we're working with uh, Brian Jones and Robert Mark, who are uh, neuroscientists that use electron microscopy. And what you see here is a uh, tiled uh, set of electron microscope images to look at a very, very small part of the brain. Those are individual neurons that you see cross sections of. So that upper red square, that is the largest, resol highest resolution of electron microscope. So that's 4K by 4K. So that's like on your, your 4K TV at home and or your 4K monitor on your desk. And they have this amazing system by which they slice the smallest little piece of brain, image it at the highest resolution of the EM, and then they dump it off the disk. Slice, image, dump, slice, image, dump, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when they get done, it doesn't quite look like this. So my colleague Tolga Tazazin, who's an image analysis researcher, has figured out ways to register all of those, those data sets together. And when they get done, the one of these slices uh, of all of those registered together is 200,000 by 200,000 pixels. And the resolution is two nanometers per pixel, two times 10 to the minus nine meters per pixel. That's how highly resolved that is. And then they do the next slice and the next slice. And, you, and what happens is that they can't slice nearly as, as finely as they can do this imaging. And so you see there's actually quite a bit of of uh, things happening and changes when they when they slice this. And so the tracking becomes a really a big challenge. And uh, Tolga has has created a number of new algorithms to do this, this tracking of the neurons um, automatically. And when they get done, one of these little bitty volumes of brain is 16 and a half terabytes. And then they tell us, uh, we'd like to visualize that now interactively. And, and uh, so we, drive up and we get the disks out and we drive back down to the Institute and, uh, and we visualize it. So we have a system by which uh, we can interactively visualize that entire 16 and a half terabytes. And it was really great because no one had ever seen this data at this resolution. And the neuroscientists saw new structures and they started writing Nature and Cell and other journal articles. Um, and they were making discoveries by looking. And I, I think of this as, as a similar, um, similar thing as when Antoine Leeuwenhoek created the microscope or, and he was able to, to, to discover new science because no one had ever seen uh, things through the lens of a microscope. And I think of this as like a, a new type of microscope where we're able to, with their technology on the experimental side and our ability to, to visualize, we're able to, to see new things. And now that they have developed a new system that is even higher resolution that will end up giving us 100 terabyte uh, per volume uh, data sets in order to visualize. So we're, we're starting to work on that. Um, just to give you a sense of the complexity of what's going on, this is one cell type uh, that they've tracked through that very small two nanometer per pixel resolution. And when they put all of them in there, there is no room. So when you think of people say our brains are highly connected, boy, are they ever. And uh, it's just astonishing to, to think about all these little interconnections uh, that are throughout our brains uh, from the neural, the neural connections. All right. Shifting gears to some uh, more information type visualization. This is Mariah Meyer. And uh, she specializes in information visualization and she did a number of projects with uh, biologists where instead of just trying to take the data and manipulate it and change the formats and get it into existing visualization systems, she took it the other way around where she uh, immersed herself into the labs with the biologists. She read their papers. She interviewed the scientists. She, she saw what the visualization analysis systems they were using. She asked what worked, what didn't work. And then she went and designed new systems from the ground up that would try to solve the problem at hand um, with the data they were using and the hypothesis that they had, and then gave the, the systems to them, got feedback, updated the systems in this kind of rapid iterative prototyping. And here are four different visualization systems that Mariah created to solve four different biological problems. 
So it's, uh, it's the opposite of the one size fits all. Um, this is one example I really like. It was work done with some geneticists at uh, the Broad Institute, which is a Harvard MIT collaborative research institute. And they were interested in looking at chromosomes from humans to other um, species. And this was the first time they put their model into Mariah's uh, system. And those thick and in the inner circle, those thick red and green bands are correct. Everything else is wrong. <laughs> and so when they saw this, they immediately knew their model was wrong. And that's another great way to use visualization is because we're so good at uh, knowing when something's wrong uh, by seeing it. And so they went back to the drawing board and they updated their model. And this was an updated version. And uh, it was better, but they knew that there must be something fundamentally wrong with the model. So they used Mariah's visualization system and, uh, and over time, months of time, uh, they came up with this visualization, which was then experimentally verified and published. And Mariah asked the PI of the study how long he thought it would have taken to get to this place without her visualization um, system. And he said, quite frankly, I don't know that we ever would have gotten there. So it's just a really great example of uh, visualization researchers working closely with application researchers, in this case, geneticists, to solve problems that neither of them could have solved by themselves. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, a video, a short video of Mariah's system. I'm sure that's, whoops. What happened there? Um, just so you see, interaction is very important in, in these systems. So I wanted to give you just a sense, and this is kind of sped up, but there's analysis tools and, and other visualization tools that she can bring in um, and uh, load in different types of data sets and be able to look at these different views. And this is what the, the geneticists use on a daily basis to, to try and try their new models and new data sets and, and uh, come up with the, the results that, that they have. All right, some more examples. Uh, this work by my colleague Valerio Pescucci, it's another big data, um, where there's so much data that's out there that it doesn't make sense anymore to move the entire data sets. They've gotten so large. And, and I've given you examples of where FedEx is, uh, is one of the highest bandwidths when you get to a particular level of data sets. And this was some, a collaboration with NASA and also Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where they have the system that's a climate simulation that they, it's a, these ensemble visualizations where they just keep running them. And the data set currently is 3.5 petabytes in size. So there's just no way that you wanna try and move that um, data. So what's, what's the option? Well, um, the option now is streaming and, uh, and what we're calling in situ types of visualization where we can make changes in the, the data either through when the simulation is running or as the data is flowing um, to back to us um, uh, and streaming. So what you see on the bottom right is actually the, uh, interactive visualization from data that's being uh, that's stored at NASA. And we have a server at Livermore, one at NASA, one at Utah. And we're able to actually um, interact with that data stream and put different filters on it and do different visualizations on the stream data. Uh, and it, it comes from this uh, IDX uh, data server. And so Valerio has created this, this data structure just based on space filling curves um, that is very cache coherent and is able to, uh, to enable computation on the fly as data is streaming. And we're gonna see more and more of this as the data sets just get bigger. Um, here are some more applications of, of the, the, the system. It's called VISUS, V-I-S-U-S. On the upper left is uh, drones flying in large agricultural fields and being stitched together as they fly through the fields and so that they can do analysis of these. So he's, he's working with over 100 farmers now uh, and deploying these drones in these big uh, agricultural fields to look at things like watering and pesticides and fertilizer usage. Um, in the uh, upper right is uh, interactive 3D segmentation of large 
neural imaging using in virtual reality. And one of the challenges with, with VR now is the lag associated with really high resolution. Well, if we stream the data like use like we did um, from the NASA data, we can actually stream much higher resolution with, with no lag. Um, and some remote visualization bottom left between uh, Utah and Italy. Okay. Um, new research areas. Uh, one of the, the areas where we've seen some really exciting new technology come out come out of in the last few years is the applications of topology to data analysis and visualization. Um, uh, and it's quite amazing because you think of topology, at least I do, as this very pure math, uh, part of mathematics uh, with lots of theorems and proofs. And, uh, and there are these researchers who have a foot knowing enough about the mathematics of topology, but making discrete digital versions of them and then being able to utilize uh, those topological theorems and proofs in discrete ways to do data analysis and visualization. And these are uh, four projects by my from my colleague Bay Wang, uh, where in the upper left she's using it to an, analyze vector fields for flow visualization in, in ocean simulations and flames and combustion time varying flow fields. In the upper right is the project I'm uh, working on with her in uh, astrophysics of using it for these very large uh, data sets, uh, uh, microwave data sets for noise reduction and finding features. Bottom left, she has a funded NIH grant that's looking at brain imaging and net brain networks. Um, and then in the bottom right is on weather prediction. And uh, it's really interesting how, how this has just uh, changed a lot of different uh, applications of, of visualization. This is the example I mentioned in astronomy. We have these, what are, what are called large data cubes uh, from microwave uh, telescopes that are in Chile at like 16,000 feet. And they're very, very large, but as you can see, they're very, very noisy. And so we use some topological analysis using contour trees to uh, and first filter the noise out and then to find features. And if you can see, there's this uh, little set of kind of orangish features there. And that is uh, from a black hole. Uh, and we use this particular part of the sky because it was already known there was a black hole there and it was, we, were, we were able to find it using our, our particular system so we could verify our, our techniques as topological data analysis and visualization. And Bay is continuing to, to develop new techniques for time varying topological analysis. And in this one, she's doing uh, network analysis. So how networks change over time and these enormous graphs that are generated by social networks, for example, and recommending engines, uh, Netflix and Amazon, et cetera. And how can you uh, track and analyze these, these enormous time varying graphs? So she has some recent work in that area too. All right, one of my um, areas of research is in uncertainty visualization. I ask people, when is the last time you've seen an error bar on an isosurface or really any indication of error or uncertainty in any three-dimensional visualization, scientific or information visualization? Uh, but for example, any of the ones I've shown so far? <laughs> the answer is almost never. <laughs> and so uh, I've been working on this along with my uh, many students and postdocs and then other colleagues uh, throughout the world in the last few years to try and come up with uh, ways to better um, show uncertainty and error in these complicated three-dimensional and sometimes time-varying data sets. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a significant challenge because oftentimes the, the data is already large scale and complicated and difficult to understand in and of itself. And now you're going to add more information on there. And so you have to figure out ways to avoid overwhelming and overloading the, the, uh, the researcher trying to understand the data, um, but at the same time, find ways to, to enable them to better understand uh, some of those errors and uncertainty. So some examples, this is a, 
uh, two versions of, of uh, what are called box plots and surface box plots. And my colleagues, Ross Whitaker and Mike Kirby, along with their, their student, uh, Masha Merzanger, uh, came up with a way to extend uh, the idea of Tukey's box plot. So on the right, you see Tukey's box plot, which is the most used uh, way of understanding uncertainty and extending it to higher dimensions. And so the, what you see in the image there is the flow past the cylinder. So it's a very classic um, CFD computation and experiment where uh, it starts to, to go in these turbulent um, vortices there. And if you can understand the Tukey box plot to the right, you can understand the contour box plot that you see there. And uh, my then former student, uh, Kirsty Potter, we worked with uh, Mark Gettin and Ian Sun, uh, who were at Texas A&M at the time, uh, and uh, created something called the surface box plots, which was a higher uh, order of this. And this is a great example, I think, of impact uh, that you can have in, in creating new visualization techniques. The folks at uh, NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, uh, read the paper about the uh, box plots and invited Ross and Mike down to Boulder to give a talk about that. And then they implemented a version of that called the Ensemble Curve Box Plots to, for hurricane tracking. Whenever there's a hurricane, we see these, these visualizations that are somewhat difficult to understand. They're, they're like 10 or so different models of where the, the hurricane the track is gonna go. And, uh, and you get kind of this uh, triangle of just lines going every which way. And so they decided to use these, uh, these box plot visualizations for hurricane tracking. This was a few years ago when Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma came up the, uh, um, the Gulf and the East Coast. And what you see were these are screenshots from the, uh, their website uh, saying that this is an experimental box plot visualization. And one on the, the right is interesting because after Masha finished her PhD, she's now an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Miami. Uh, and it's an example, probably a few, an uncommon example of where a student used their dissertation research to decide and make an important decision, which was whether to evacuate or not. And she did, and uh, that was the right, right decision to make. Some other work, uh, recent work that we've done on uncertainty visualization was more at the algorithmic level and the question was, all of these visualization algorithms in scientific visualization and information visualization, they're really assuming that we have uh, perfect data. Uh, so, you know, things like very common and well-used algorithms um, like contour mapping and isosurface extraction for scalar data, all those case tables and all the algorithms, they assume linear interpolation on uh, certain and uh, non and error free data. So the question is, well, what happens to those underlying algorithms when you start adding error and uncertainty? And uh, well, they break down at some point. And so what we're doing is looking at when do they break down? And then can we find ways to, uh, to still make them work under what levels of uncertainty? And this is some work that done within postdoc, uh, my postdoc Tushar and on both uh, contours and isosurface extraction, and we created something called the probabilistic asymptotic decider. And what you see in the, in the bottom is that blue is accurate um, and red is not. And so just showing the difference between uh, uh, the previous actually best probabilistic uh, contour algorithm and isosurface extraction algorithm and what we came up with which enabled us to incorporate, or allow for more error and uncertainty in these algorithms to still come up with, with correct answers. And uh, we recently extended this to the full uh, 3D isosurface extraction case um, and uh, published this just last October at the IEEE visualization conference. All right. Just some uh, uh, short, short snapshots and things we're, we've done. This is part of our uh, Intel Graphics and Visualization Institute. Um, we uh, use and contribute to this open source parallel ray tracing system called Osprey as part of that project. 
And so I'd like to let people know about this um, because it is really great. Intel has allowed all of that to be open source. Um, and, and so we're, we're very, we're an open source, open model, open data shop. And so we, open science is, is a really great thing. And, and so you can get all of this uh, data and, and it was recently implemented within Paraview as one of the rendering choices that's, that's in there. And we continue to add new uh, capabilities to this. And this is one of the things that we've done recently, which is doing adaptive mesh refinement data for ray tracing. Ray tracing assumes that you have a uniform grids. Um, everything is the same size. There are maybe thousands of papers out there written about uh, performance increases on for ray tracing and computer graphics and volume visualization using uniform grids. Well, simulation people have moved on and they have been using adaptive mesh refinement for many years now. And, uh, and currently they would have to resample their meshes and make them uniform in order to visualize their simulations, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, so we have been working on ways to create uh, parallel ray tracing systems uh, for adaptive mesh refinement. This is using this, uh, this really large scale NASA flow where, where we have tree-based uh, refinement. This is some for uh, other types of refinement uh, using something called the brick tree to do very large interactive visualization in, uh, in Osprey um, with different data sets. And, and we've also been working on uh, ways to make using and creating these, uh, these multi-tiled walls um, easier to do um, so and less expensive to do. So this was a, a paper that we wrote, um, I guess it's now a year and a half or so ago, on creating a tiled wall. And we used these very low cost uh, Intel NUX uh, as the cluster and uh, put these together. Uh, and we were able to do really large scale visualizations with them. And we created an open source system that links into Osprey. So you can, there's a GitHub uh, link to this where you can download everything and then make your own wall of you know four or eight or 16 or however many however many tiles you want in a, in a really inexpensive uh, way. All right. This is uh, some ongoing work with my former student, uh, Han Wei Shen, who's now been a professor at Ohio State University for many years. And we collaborated with uh, his students and one of my postdocs to come up with a way to, uh, to do use interactive lenses for uh, large scale three-dimensional flow field visualization, vector field visualization. Uh, as you can see, the problem with it is that if you just look at the 3D visualization, it's just dense flows, it just looks like a pile of spaghettis. Um, one of uh, Hanwei's students came up with this highly interactive um, lens system where we can deform, kind of push away the, the fields and go in and look at the, you know, the trees within the forests. And the, the CFD people, fluid dynamicists, they really enjoy playing with this and looking at their data with this because there is just such amazing control uh, that you have there. Uh, throughout this project, we realized this was the same challenge that neurosurgeons had uh, in using diffusion tensor images for pre-surgical planning for tumor resection. So it created this set of overlapping lenses in which neurosurgeons could go in and remove sets of white matter tracts a bit at a time for their neurosurgical planning. And we've met now with multiple neurosurgeons and have uh, lots of feedback on what they would like to see and how to make this uh, better for, for what they had. And some of their recommendations were like five minute color maps and uh, changes and some of them are like five year research projects, which is great. So, uh, so that's an ongoing research project that we uh, continue to work on. All right, let me finish up here. We work really hard and, uh, uh, and we drink a lot of coffee. And so this is the, uh, we have five espresso machines at the Ski Institute in case four break down, we still have, we still have one going on. Um, and also we have this ping pong table. We learned that uh, ping pong seems to be the international sport of nerds because it's, it's really quite amazing the different nationalities and the numbers that play ping pong. We got one on wheels because we thought we would just roll it out every once in a while. This is in our reception area 
and it stays out all the time because people are using it all the time. We have a we have an annual uh, tournament uh, where we have people from all over the world, you know, students and staff and faculty playing playing ping pong. The uh, upper right is one of my former students uh, who won the uh, one of uh, our our annual tournaments, uh, and we knew it it was going to be a challenge because he came with his own ping pong paddle in a zippered leather cover. <laughs> and so we, we thought he'd played before and we were right. All right, well, thank you very much for allowing me to share just a, a few examples of our visualization research with you. Many, many, many more are there. I hope you'll head to the website. Uh, all of our publications are online. All of our software packages are online uh, and they're all open source. So Flow Render is there, ImageViz 3D, um, many, many other, other packages are online. If you have any questions, I, I hope you'll uh, send me an email and, and, uh, and ask. So thanks very much. Sorry, Chris, I'm muted. Can you hear me now? Any questions for me? Chris, can you hear me if I speak into the mic? Yes. Wonderful. OK, yeah. so we, we're going to field now questions from both the, the room not, and uh, wait. Sorry, turn back on. I had myself muted there, uh, the computer muted. Can you ask your question again? Uh, yes, I just wanted to make sure you could hear me and to let you know that we're now going to take a Q&A that kind of yes. jumps between the, the Zoom, people on Zoom and people here in the room. So Sounds I'll start great. by handing off the microphone to someone here in the room. And if you're on Zoom and you have a question for Chris, please either. Thank you, sorry. So if you have a question in this room, please raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. If you are on Zoom and have a question, please raise your hand on Zoom or put your question in the chat and we'll do our best to get as many as we can answered today. I'm gonna to hand the microphone off to someone here in the room. So how can this take note? Um, right. The mic is cutting out. Um, so how can this technology affect the video game industry since such are so closely tied? Yeah, the, uh, so we, uh, we have folks who are more on the computer graphics side and, of the world than the visualization side. And, and uh, the parallel rendering is, is one of the big crossovers between the, the games uh, side of the world and and uh, let me uh, stop sharing my screen there. Get out of it is, uh, yep, um, is, sorry, I'm just trying to get my, my uh, set up again. And, so the, the games are the right the rendering the parallel uh, ray tracing and rendering is, is really where the crossover is and uh, because the the screen the, the resolution for games and special effects just keeps getting higher and higher and higher um, people want more realism and so there's more physics based simulation going on and and so the the, the amounts of being able to render are just keep growing astronomically and it's the same thing on the scientific visualization side where the data set sizes are just getting larger and larger. And so, uh, so some of our technology in terms of the parallel ray tracing uh, has made it into uh, some of NVIDIA's work, for example, in the optics uh, rendering that they have and actually some of the algorithms originally from uh, some of the ray tracing done by one of my former students, Steve Parker, it has been made into hardware and into the new RTX chips. Uh, that uh, NVIDIA uses for, for their work. And, uh, and then we uh, also have been uh, incorporating things into the Osprey parallel ray tracing system, which is used both for scientific visualization and, and for games and, and movie and special effects. Wonderful, thanks, Chris. We'll take now a question from the chat. And someone is asking how much um, does aesthetic value get taken into the visualization process? Is it that important or more focused? Um, or is the focus more on the data set and the science behind it? 
Could you speak yeah, to that? Yeah, the answer is yes on all of those fronts. Um, uh, the uh, in terms of the aesthetics, I'll I'll say that that we think of maybe design um, is an integral part part of of creating a good visualization, uh, both in terms of interaction and understanding. So we're after understanding, and and so how we perceive. Uh, and understand things is is of uh, utmost importance. And so we work with we work with uh, with perceptive perceptual psychologists. We work with artists, um, and uh, there's more and more work that's being done in terms of uh, working with artists and design uh, of creating those interfaces from the beginning. So, in, for many years, the computer graphics and visualization researchers were almost all computer scientists. And they would just sit down at a computer and just start like programming an interface. Uh, and if you work with with artists and ask them, well, how would you design this interface? They would take out their sketch pads, and then they would make like fifty different versions of what this might look like. And then they would go and, and triage them and say, oh, this you know I like this from this and that. And, that. and uh, so we've been taking that into account a lot more in terms of of designing good uh, visualizations. It's also the case that some of the visualizations that we create are, they, they are beautiful. Um, we had uh, the Kimball Art Gallery in Park City uh, had a, uh, a presentation of our visualization research at, for, I guess, about two or three months. We had one of the entire galleries. And for example, the, the Michelangelo visualization and the, uh, that uh, visualization of the, the, the galaxy, the spiral galaxy, Forming, and we had a number of other visualizations uh, that were captivating from a from really an artistic and um, and, and uh, something that we we really could appreciate from more than the scientific part. So I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, but that's a, a stab at it. Thanks so much. Are there other questions in the watch party room? Other questions for Chris, maybe on Zoom. Yes. Hi, Chris. Can you Hello. hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you. It's a wonderful talk. You know, we here at Texas A&M, uh, the visualization department, are also are beyond our current work on computer graphics for entertainment industry. We also initiate several projects on the application visual computing in scientific or information visualization. So I will say whether you could share some of your experience, especially in the early stage. How, to, how did you get started 30 years ago, especially in terms of at this is a kind of interdisciplinary research, right? At the interface of many things, funding, organization, how do you place your faculty members are, are across different departments? But I'm sorry, this needs many questions, but appreciate you could give us some insight in a brief way. Sure, yeah, interdisciplinary research and collaborations are challenging no matter what. Uh, and they, I think are even more challenging sometimes in a university environment um, because the university is, is set, up, set up more in these kind of uh, silos of departments and colleges and money flows and uh, faculty position flows along those kind of those structures. And so when you come to a university that's set up that way and you want to do something that's cross cutting across, you know, many different departments and uh, colleges, uh, there's not a structure to do that. And so you have to invent one. And that's, that's really challenging. Um, I was really lucky that uh, that I was able to work with a, a provost who had been formerly a dean of engineering at Utah, who was using the Ski Research Center Research Group and then Institute as a uh, as a trial of how could we create uh, a structure for interdisciplinary research. And so we we had for many years trials and errors of how we were going to structure that and how faculty positions were created and. Uh, and, and governed and, and, uh, and done with the departments and, and then finally came up with a model back around 2000 that's worked well for the last 20 plus years. And, 
And just as an example, the faculty, so the faculty slots at SKI are given, the budget is given to the Institute, um, but then the appointment is in a particular department like computer science or mathematics or physics or wherever it is. And, uh, and so it really is kind of a power sharing. We can't, we can't hire faculty um, without the departments and the departments, we have the budget. And so they have to work with us to get the faculty slot in their department. And, uh, and so we, we go out with the Ski Institute, decide, faculty decide what areas we want to hire in, information visualization or scientific visualization or medical imaging or whatever. And then we go to a chair of a department and say, hey, we, we have this new faculty position in this area. Would you like to hire somebody in this area with us? And then we do a, a joint search and, and uh, find these, uh, these amazing people. Um, and the Institute has its own, we have, uh, our own space uh, and and then graduate students come I think we have at any one time 80 to 90 PhD students and they come from at least eight different departments CS and then bioengineering and bioinformatics and physics and math and uh, but they all sit together in these joint labs uh, and then work with uh, the, the different faculty uh, but then they get their degrees in whatever department they're at and I learned a lot of this uh, from just talking with like Ivan Sutherland and Ed Catmull and, and Alan Kay and John Warnock about how you know, they structured things back in the early days uh, at Utah and, uh, and, and really learned about how to get the very best people and provide uh, a space where interdisciplinary collaboration is possible. And I just lucked out that I had a senior administrator that uh, was able was interested in in supporting that kind of interdisciplinary research, and I note that I, as director of the institute, reported directly to the provost, to the senior academic vice president for, uh, and that's another thing because the if you report to chairs and deans, then it's really hard to do the full interdisciplinary way of doing things. So that that's a kind of a short answer to a, a very long uh, question. By the way, uh, the University of Utah Marriott Library just recently published a history of the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute um, based upon interviews with, with many people, including the president of the university and myself and others. I'll, I'll send you a link to that um, in case you're interested. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I want to be mindful of your time. And we do have one final question that came in the chat about the possibility of visualizing um, uncertainty in the area of phylogeny with discontinuous and, and branching tree data. Um, but um, I'm hoping that maybe we can plant the seed for this question and maybe uh, David can get in touch with you directly and get you kind of thinking about this. In the meantime, I'd really love to thank you once more for being the inaugural speaker for our Spring 22 Field of Vision speaker series. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Uh, my pleasure, thanks, thanks for attending.